told him that uh, he should. He never met Charlie Ferguson. So Who had? John Georges. Really. So uh, I, I think uh, I think they'll be having lunch sometime soon. Mm -hmm. So and we'll get we'll get a full report from both of them. Uh, we're ready. We I think we are. Can you hear us? Do we need to talk loud or just normally? Just normal. Okay. And uh, the lighting's good. And, well, um, just to begin, we're sitting here <coughs> in the dining room of uh, Moon and Verna Landrew uh, on South Freer Street in New Orleans. It's September 24th, 2013. Uh, we're talking to Moon Landrew. We will not go through an elaborate uh, uh, introduction, uh, but pertinent to the subject uh, that we hope to talk about today, namely focusing on the 1970s. Uh, he was the mayor of New Orleans uh, from 1970 to 1978 uh, and uh, was on stage uh, for much of the important events that were happening to shape New Orleans in, uh, in that decade and afterwards. Uh, I'm Jack Davis uh, interviewing and I'm accompanied by Justin Nystrom, uh, professor of history at uh, Loyola University. And this is part of the Loyola uh, Oral History Project underway in the past year. Um, so Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for, You're welcome, for joining us. Um, you know, our theory, as, as I've, you and I have talked about before, is that uh, the 1970s was a period of uh, pivotal uh, change in New Orleans. Uh, they were, it's one of those times when, uh, when one could say that uh, sea changes were taking place, uh, perhaps between World War II and, uh, and Katrina, this was perhaps the most eventful decade, the most eventful period in, uh, in New Orleans modern history. And first of all, I wanted to see if you agree with me on that, uh, the idea that the, the 1970s made uh, a difference in shaping modern New Orleans. And, and maybe we could talk about some of the ways that, uh, that uh, the the city was different uh, in 1980 than in 1970. Jack, I think it's uh, what it, what you said is true, but I do think that every era uh, is important. Sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. I do not believe that uh, you can measure 1960 to 1907 with any precision. It isn't as if the clock begins or runs out at the end of a 10-year period. Right. There is an overlapping degree, and there's a progression or a regression uh, from the beginning of the founding of New Orleans to wherever it goes in the future. And I think before you can... Or while you're looking, let me put it that way, while you're looking at that 10-year period, give or take uh, a couple of years, I think it's wise to understand uh, that that 10-year period doesn't float in isolation. It's not there as if it were unaffected yes. by what came before it. Uh, and it's very difficult also to look at it without realizing, uh, trying to evaluate what impact did it have on the time beyond that? What, what impact did it have on the 80s and 90s and, and for the New Orleans of the future? Yeah. And we could talk about that. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, I know that's kind of spreading the arms out and taking in the whole world, but it's almost impossible to fairly accurately, reasonably explain a period of time uh, without examining what happened before and then that, when you have passed it, look back and see, okay, what, what was it? What, what, in fact, what, in, what in fact did happen of any consequence? And we do have to look back to the 60s and earlier to yes, find the, the yes, forces absolutely. at work. Much uh, earlier, yes. Uh, especially in the, in the area of uh, race relations and integration. 
uh, the economic development of, of the city. Uh, well, in all of those things, yeah. Jack, whether in economics, uh, whether in politics, uh, uh, even in the physical aspects, uh, for instance, it perhaps is not foreseen, but the interstate highway system, the idea of which I guess began before the 50s, but I remember mm -hmm. it being basically a very important part of President Eisenhower's program in the, in the early 50s. Who thought about it? I don't know, but nonetheless, the Federal Highway Program for defense purposes after the war uh, uh, took shape and, uh, and started to develop. Now, some of it was built before 1960, uh, but the highway is still being built around the United right. States. If not, in a sense, built, it's being improved, changed, added to uh, across the United States. And that system of highways, uh, perhaps many people understood but I don't think it was done for that purpose, but it caused a sprawl outside of central cities. Yeah, when this came on, when Interstate 10 came online in New Orleans in the 1960s. Yes. Uh, I think the Claiborne Avenue part of it was... Correct, and... and 1968. Right, and uh, I mean, one of the big arguments we had in the, in the late 60s was the interstate highway system as it went through the riverfront in New Orleans. Uh, it, the, it, the, the famous riverfront expressway right, proposal. And, and, and of course it was being built, where was it being built? It was being built in the western side of the city first so that uh, that part was completed before, quite lengthily before, mm -hmm. a long time before the eastern part was which caused people to move out into Jefferson Parish, or it didn't cause them, gave them the opportunity to move out of the central city. That, that was coupled with the GI Bill uh, and the then rules of the uh, Federal Housing Association, Federal Housing Authority which favored building of new houses rather than rehabilitation. And in large quantity. Oh, yeah. So it was much easier to go into a suburban parish, buy an inexpensive lot where similar things were happening, and, uh, and build a house with substantial financing from the GI Bill or from the Federal Housing Authority. Uh, and abandon the property which was you were living in in the inner city. Not abandoning it in the sense of running away from it, but just leaving for new and right. better, better housing. And as that happened, the population of the inner cities all across America began to decrease. Well, we just have housing stock that they had now, that they were here to poor occupying. What happens to that housing stock? What happens to that area that was all housing and all of a sudden now it's being vacated? What happens to the commercial establishments that were in those places? So <coughs> I've likened it to plates moving under us. You can think of the geology, and I'm not a geologist, but if you think of the plates under us, they're moving. We don't feel them. We don't even know they're moving, but they're moving. And over thousands of years, the continents have shifted. Uh, Lake Pontchartrain, which was once maybe 150 miles <laughs> distance, is now uh, drawn back. And uh, Lake Pontchartrain gets created. The Mississippi River now is flowing past us. So those things are happening, and they're going to continue to happen. That's just the way of nature over that period of time. The mankind constantly is trying to develop barriers and direct nature uh, 
where we want it to go, as we're now doing with the wetlands and as we've done with the Mississippi River by levying the river uh, so that it doesn't flood New Orleans, but then on the other hand, we don't build up wetlands when we've now directed the river out into the, yeah. uh, in between the levee system. Well, and these, these tectonic, tectonic forces that were leading people to, to redefine the city. That is correct. We're sort of operating in the same way. Did, did you, when you were running, uh, I'm sorry, C could you cuff the right sleeve of your sport coat? The buttons what? are hitting the table, and it sounds like somebody dropping pennies on the table every now and then. Oh, I'll try oh, you the buttons? Well, you can leave it on. It's, it, they don't show, uh, but, but when they, yeah, that, yeah. I got you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. For emphasis, sometimes. Well, for emphasis, might be one. <laughs> like the uh, who was the general who thumped his VMI ring on the table? Yeah, yeah. Patton. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the the, the forces, the, the tectonic urban forces that were leading people out of New Orleans, did, a lot of cities didn't realize what their interstate highway system was doing to them. In the in the way that you're describing growth of the suburbs and that's correct. And I, did and you did you see it? Did you see it when you were in the legislature in the 1960s and on the city council in the 1960s, and then running for mayor in '69? Did you see the decline of the city as the uh, as as a, an issue to be solved? No, not at that early date. I didn't. Uh, obviously, if one were paying careful attention, you could see it in the 60s. Because in 1960, our census said that we had, I believe, uh, 627,000 people living in the city of New Orleans. And, uh, <coughs> pardon me, and by the 1970s, we were down to 500. So, I mean, that's a fairly significant shift of people outside of the city. But I think it's a mistake to think that that is where, if you wanted to talk about rise and decline, for instance, and one could argue, well, that's where New Orleans began to decline. Well, position depends upon your relationship to others, not just in isolation. Uh, at one time, New Orleans had 85% of the population of the entire metropolitan area. So if you think of St. Tammany, uh, Jefferson Parish, St. Bernard, Plaquemine, New Orleans, city of New Orleans had 85% of the population. I don't exactly know what census that was, but uh, I'm figuring... 1860, 1870, yeah. I think one would have to look, but I've seen the figure, but I just don't know the, 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 the date of that census. But from that time forward, the percentage of population that New Orleans had be, began to lessen. It wasn't that the population was shrinking, the population was growing, but our dominance as the center of population was decreasing. So does that mean that therefore the influence of New Orleans was decreasing? No, we still were the largest, we still were the, were the most dominant and vital part of the region, but our relationship was changing. So that today, if we now look back at the, at the 70s, uh, 1970, we had 500,000 people. Now, let's say we have 360,000. But Jefferson Parish probably has 400,000 now. So we don't have 85% of the metropolitan area. We probably have less than 50%. Yes. Certainly less than 50%. Well, now, when, when if you didn't campaign on, if you, or if the campaign wasn't, driven by this urgency about the, the keeping the city as a viable place, you realized, your administration realized that fairly quickly. You made a speech two, well, we, two no, years I, after you made it. Maybe I misunderstood your, yeah. your question, Jack. I don't say that we, you asked me about, did I think about it in the 60s? Well, then again, that's a 10-year span. 
I can't, I can't tell you that I thought about it in 1960, but certainly by mid, by the mid uh, 1965, let's say mid 60s, uh, it became evident that this many pe that many people were moving outside of Orleans Parish, and it was happening all across the United States. But it was an event. It wasn't so much the interstate highway system that that brought it to your attention. It was, as I said, the GI Bill of Rights with the with the uh, veterans coming back home and FHA, and that's happening all during the fifties now. Uh, but yet, even with that happening during the fifties, New Orleans reaches a peak uh, population in 1960 of 627,000 right. people. So even with FHA happening, the city was still, still at least theoretically growing, unless you looked at, took a census in 1958 and 1959 and saw that in those two years we lost people too. But if you looked at the census figures from 19, 50 to 60, we grew in that period of time, even though the GI Bill was in effect and people were moving uh, into single homes, 20-foot setbacks, and in nice, nice communities in suburbia. But it doesn't mean that that wasn't having a, an impact on, on the city, because it certainly didn't end our growth, but it certainly retarded the growth. And then on top of that, if you had the interstate highway system coming in, which made it easier for people to get out, looking for a reason why people were leaving. Uh, so you can add the interstate highway system on to the GI Bill and the FHA, and then obviously a huge factor was the integration of public schools. And it was a fear factor that spread very widely uh, that, uh, that the inner city schools were going to be integrated. Doesn't mean that they didn't anticipate that the suburban schools would ultimately be integrated, but it would be a different kind of integration, a different place, different time, different economic group. So all of those things caused us, by the time I ran for office in 1969, to begin to look at the fact that many of the people had moved, but they were still working in New Orleans. We were still the job base. We were still the economic engine, despite the comparative loss in population. So. If you remember, I had advanced uh, income tax. Right. Uh, a, uh, a metropolitan earnings. Metropolitan earnings tax, I'm sorry. A metropolitan earnings tax, which was designed to compensate the city for the number of people who were coming in using our streets, needing police protection, fire protection, and then leaving uh, in, as, as evening fell. Uh, taking with them their earnings, but not really doing anything of economic value for the city government. I'm not saying for the companies they work for. Of course, that was a terribly unpopular idea. And and, uh, and this was when you were mayor. This, first, that, is, that is correct. First years of your mayoral Well, Well, it, it, yes, but it wasn't... Uh, you no, know, the idea... The idea had first been submitted uh, in a financial report that was audited, uh, I guess I can't say the administration audited it, it's called the Madison Report, and I believe that it stemmed from somehow from good government groups or whatever, but then I forget the basis of the those who requested it. But it came out and said that New Orleans was in very deep financial trouble and it needed to uh, improve its revenue base. And it suggested uh, an income tax. Uh, 
that issue came up in 1966-67. In time to become an issue in the mayor's race well, in 69. Well, I continued to talk about it as a uh, as a uh, as something we had to look at. Uh, the public was given the right to choose between an earnings tax or a one cent sales tax. I was on the council at the time. I think I was president of city council when that was passed. And uh, because some of the councilmen wouldn't vote for the sales tax without giving, or at least income tax, without giving the public the right to the sales tax. Uh, I was opposed to the sales tax because I thought it was certainly detrimental to the poor uh, and an unfair tax given that we already had a significant sales tax. Uh, but the public overwhelmingly <laughs> differed with me and, uh, and voted in favor of the sales tax, uh, excuse me, yes, and they voted in favor of the sales tax and rejected the earnings tax altogether. So yes, uh, it was very much a part of what we what we discussed in the mayor's race in, in 1969, but bear in mind, public had already rejected the income tax, and neither I nor anybody was trying to advocate uh, that strongly that we ought to impose an income tax on on the public. But we were looking at, I certainly was looking at ways to tax those who were living outside the city limits, and uh, and working inside and uh, and not contributing. In addition to that, New Orleans had all of the parks. I mean, as suburbia grew, let me rephrase that. Looking back now, it's clear that that what happened, you know, is the chicken or the egg. What what comes first? Well, sometimes it's happening together. But does the commercial establishment start, do the jobs come first and then the people follow, or did the people go and then the jobs followed them? Uh, Lakeside Shopping Center got started. Uh, so people, instead of shopping in New Orleans, now began to shop in Lakeside Shopping Center, Canal Street, which was once a very vibrant uh, commercial place with D.H. Holmes and Maison Blanche. They ain't there no more, as the song goes. Uh, but the, the, the sales began to shift to Jefferson Parish, too. Right. There were no auto dealers out in Jefferson Parish. They were all in Orleans Parish, and automobile dealers began to shift out. Uh, so now, so then, to what extent could we say that the one of the missions of the Landrieu administration was to bring back the city as a desirable place <coughs> for people to live and to shop. Well, there's I mean, no you, question. I think that that... I did, think did, did you, mayor, like, before you took office, did you think that's what you were going to have to do? Yes. Or did it emerge as you, you no, appointed... No, I, I, uh, I knew the city was in Syria, being on the city council and having been a legislator, I knew the city was in serious financial trouble, and if you look at one of the ads we ran, and it was, can a man who tells the truth win? That was a campaign ad. The campaign ad, and it was really a recitation, so to speak, not that ad itself, but what it meant was, look at the Madison report, this is the truth. We are hurting. We're in deep trouble. And we have to change in many ways. So the argument was for change. Now, what did that change mean? How specific could you be in a campaign? Uh, how clear were you in any event after you got elected that this is exactly what I want to do? Things evolve. Uh, one of the things that I was absolutely certain of was that we could not continue to be a city divided by race as we were. Uh, there was no way in my judgment that uh, we could continue on that path. 
that uh, we had half the city working and the other half, not I mean totally jobless, but virtually without, without any hope of serious, serious jobs that weren't contributing uh, to the economic well-being mm -hmm. of the city because we weren't permitting them to contribute to the economic well-being of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so integrating the city racially became one of the ways in which we could restore New Orleans. Uh, that certainly was a factor. It, the other thing from a physical standpoint, uh, it's clear that the New Orleans was, uh, uh, to me, was overly, overly populated for the amount of square footage that we were occupying. I mean, if you look at the city of New Orleans and see that we had 627,000 people living in New Orleans without, without now, essentially the lakefront development, uh, without a significant part of, uh, of uh, Lakeview, mm -hmm. without New Orleans East, and without Algiers <laughs> beside the other than you know, the look, I mean, what is the, uh, the right, well, where the bridge comes down, I'm, I'm lost for words for a moment, but, but the whole new development in, in, uh, in Algiers was not in place. Now think of it. We had 627,000 people living without those things. Now those things are built, and now we've got 500,000 people. So we've got 500,000 people <laughs> living in a much, much broader area. I don't mean vacant, I mean occupied areas. So you had to deal with that. I mean, the, the demands for roads was different. The demands for sanitation was different. Uh, every 10 year, every administration, eight year administration, if you want to measure it by administration, runs into these these changes and uh, you have to deal with them as you see them. But I saw the need uh, to preserve New Orleans. I initially was not seen as a preservationist. I think, as it turns out, our administration may go down as with some and be given great credit for the historic preservation because it wasn't just a matter of paint color or how the balcony is configured but of maintaining the nature of our housing and our neighborhoods. And maintaining that, the integrity of the neighborhoods. Right, that made us what we are. Now some of that was not in isolation. When did you, when did you and your team start realizing that that was, the, you know, the neighborhood, <coughs> the major neighborhood rehabilitation thrust that you began? When, when did that become well, Jack, you start off looking. At, you start off with the controversy that it has always existed since the mid '30s about the French Quarter. So we got a French Quarter thing. Uh, how do we preserve this? This is where the city started. Many people, and it wasn't always a beautiful place. Let's let's know that. Uh, there were periods where it was pretty slummy, but thanks to many people who worked and saw its importance, uh, most of it has been preserved. So there was already the concept of historic preservation, but the other aspects of historic preservation took a little more time to develop. For one thing, the federal government, when it passed the uh, Model Cities program and other federal programs, uh, you know, on a national basis, wanted cities to begin to identify where the money was going to be spent. If we're going to be sending you money for these programs, identify where it's going because part of the cities, particularly in the South, and I think this is true generally, uh, the cities were independent of the federal government. 
independent to the extent we're not getting finances from the federal government. We're getting housing, FHA, and individuals getting help, but cities directly won't. But now we're into wanting to help cities, and we will send you money to help with poverty, but where are you going to spend it? Because heretofore, you've taken the city's money and you spent it in all the white neighborhoods and the black neighborhoods of Suffolk. So they wanted to be sure that we were spending the money because we had to justify these programs in those neighborhoods. And we did a survey and began to define New Orleans more specifically than uptown and downtown or New Orleans East and, and Carrollton. So now we develop this neighborhood distinction by, by you, define you, definite you, street line. You defined dozens and dozens of neighborhoods. Yes, and, we did. Yes, and, we did. And gave some of them names that they that they didn't know they had. Yes, yes, we certainly did that. And uh, and some of them we had to make up names. But uh, uh, and I know you want me to tell the story about oh, that. Oh no, I'm not. I was just, it just seems to me that this that that. that Throughout the 1970s, there was, on all sides, people were trying to make the city more livable, and it seemed that a lot of the energy for that was coming from the Landrieu administration. And was it, I mean, and also, um, you, uh, two years into your administration, you gave a speech in which you said it's absolutely vital to protect the core of New Orleans and to make the core area a viable place. You had already been working for, for years on, the, the, on building the Superdome, and you decided help locate it in the downtown area where it would presumably make it have a big impact. So, so it seems that the, you, were, you were working both on neighborhoods and the downtown core, and the Superdome was a big part of that. And was that I all think, part? I think, no, I think Jack. Anyone who runs for office, I mean, if you if you're serious about it, ought to have a reason why you're running. You know, mm -hmm. not just title, not unless you just, you know, want to have your name out there so that it uh, get you, helps your ego. But, but I think any serious person running for office has some idea that I can do some good. Well, what is that good? Uh, I was fortunate in having had six years in the state legislature and four years on the city council. And in that learning period, now that was not the only learning period of my life. I mean, I hope I've been learning since I was born, even though most of my teachers perhaps didn't think so. But, but uh, I, I knew that New Orleans was just a great, great place. It had a great history, it was a wonderful future, but Somehow or another, we weren't handling the present correctly. Not that you could reverse everything, and we couldn't be what we once were. But on the other hand, what did make us what we, what we were? What, what, what made New Orleans what I think is so, so beautiful and so different from many, many, many most other places in the world? And I concluded that, number one, it was a mixture of people. New Orleans, since its founding, has had a, a unique population mix, I mean, from its very beginning. I don't think there's another city <laughs> in the world that, uh, that was founded uh, with the same racial... Uh, ethnic mix that New Orleans was, and it grew that way. I mean, just the fact that you read about the, 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 the history of the founding of the city and the, the Indian tribes and the, and the African-American slaves and the African-American free people and the Haitians and, and, uh, and the Spanish and the French and running into one another and the formation of Okay, I guess we ought to plant the city here. I mean, and the, I mean, there were explorers here before the founding of New Orleans, and not only explorers, there were 
quite a few people here before the founding. But we eventually decide, okay, we, we, we've got this bayou coming in to this, to this, and this is close we can get to the Mississippi coming in from that side, so let's come in through Bayou St. John. And we've got the Mississippi River, and this is a wonderful place where we can defend the city and claim this to be our city. And lo and behold, France decides to create a a planned city over here. Big real estate deal, right? One of the few cities, as far as I know, in America that was a planned city. I mean, just carve out the streets and everything was planned in advance. Most people just said, I'm, I'm tired, I'm stopping, this is as far as I'm going. And other people said the same thing, and the city and town developed. But, uh, so you looked at the people, and that was the strength and the beauty of the city from one aspect. Uh, the other thing was its great physical attractions. I mean, what made the city? Why are we here? Well, you t we're here for two reasons. Basically, Mississippi River, but also Lake Pontchartrain. So we got these two great assets, Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River, who were both, I guess you can say, great gifts and at the same time can cause us great tragedies themselves. But they're physical and they're there. Uh, and the other thing that I had that had already developed was New Orleans had, had a very unique central business district. Uh, we weren't the strongest in the world, we weren't the biggest in the world, but it was a very unique district. Canal Street, uh, right on the edge of the French Quarter, and then the uh, office mm -hmm. section. Uh, Canal Street was extraordinarily unique. Uh, and did you see that as being in peril? Yes, you, no. And, and well, yes, I did, because we knew by the time I got into office or ran for office that a significant amount of the business of the central business district was leaving. Canal Street was, uh, was being depleted. Now, all of it hadn't happened at one time, but you could see the sales, the sales moving uh, to other outlying areas. Now, even if it were not out of the parish, it was moving to other, other, other locations mm -hmm. rather than the central business district. So, how does a mayor tackle that? I mean, uh, <coughs> as I recall, you had a lot of well, I came talented up, staff people. This is. Perhaps this is a brag. I, I just was thinking about it one day, and perhaps there are 50 different people could tell you that they came up with it, but I, I simply recall myself emphasizing so strongly the fact of uh, the preservation of the engine, and I spoke to this many times, that if we lost our economic engine, we would never be able to hold together these other neighborhoods that we're trying to preserve. Uh, and uh, having, uh, having worked on the dome and been chairman of the commission that built the dome, I was curious as to why we couldn't use a similar, sorry again, I ran my thing, why we couldn't use a similar uh, vehicle like the dome stadium district constitutional theory uh, to create a district for uh, and give it a tax tax authority and uh, so we had it checked out and the lawyers came back and said mayor you can do it it's, it's doable it just took us to go to the state legislature and get the necessary legislation passed uh, to create the downtown development district as it's now called, and yes, still it exists. turned out to be the first one in the United States of America. I'm told Canada had one before. I was not aware of that. Uh, but I'm told it's the first one in America, and it's a pretty widespread concept now. But, but the idea was just thinking so much about how do we preserve this, this economic engine that is the downtown shopping district 
when other people across the United States were fast losing theirs. When I tell you losing them, they were citizens in the United States. <laughs> that, that was amazing. I mean, if you go to Monroe, for instance, Louisiana, and look at what was downtown Monroe, and look at what happened when they started to build suburban shopping malls. I mean, it just, I go there and I, I have my son-in-law's from Monroe and I have lots of friends up there and I really love the place uh, as a place to visit and place to live. But, but as an urbanologist, you're kind of shocked by how, how its center just literally died not that Monroe did, but how the center died as they built this, these huge shopping centers on the outside. So the whole retail chain is changing, the whole retail world was changing with the Walmarts, uh, the Winn-Dixies, and the, the big box stores. Now they were not all moving out of town, but those were the first moves were on the outskirts where you had cheap land rather than rather than take up a, a ten square blocks of property and have to buy it and tear them all down. You can move out next to an interstate interchange, and the land is not occupied, so it's very inexpensive to buy compared to inner city land, and the transportation is terrific. So bang, you you build these these shopping malls, and God bless them. I mean, it's worked for, some, for humanity, but it was devastating to the central city. So how do you combat that in 1972 in New Orleans? What, what's the tools set <coughs> that you use? Well, first of all, you can't only look to the other fellow to, to blame your ills on them. Sometimes your ills are self-inflicted. And that is, what were we doing to make our place a competitive, attractive place? What we doing about trash uh, on Canal Street? What were we doing about crime? Why were people, yes, some people were, had moved out and were living uh, in Jefferson or St. Bernard, and therefore shopping where they live. But what about those Orleanians who used to shop downtown, who are now leaving all these to go shop and then coming back, uh, carrying their goods in the back of their car. So the thought was, well, what are we not doing here to make that area attractive? So if you think of the, the uh, Central Business District, uh, they had a tax. They taxed themselves, so people couldn't complain, well, you're taking my money to, to fix the central business district because we're poor and we deserve the money more than they do. They had taxed themselves to see if they couldn't improve their access, improve uh, police protection, uh, beautification, and a multitude of things. And it's it's clearly not the salvation yeah. of the downtown, but it, the CBD has played a very important role in, in the rebirth of downtown New Orleans. And you also created um, the first historic districts outside of the French Quarter, the first historic district since the 1930s. And the CBD historic district, I believe, was a response by your administration to the fact that so many of the historic buildings were being demolished for parking lots. Well, I wish I could tell you that I, I take full credit <laughs> for for starting the historic districts, and then it has turned out, I think, extremely beneficial to the city. But it happened more, I don't say that it happened by accident, but it happened without my uh, kind of having thought about it and exactly saying this is what we have to do. Was there somebody? There was a, there was a fire that took place on uh, on uh, Dryad Street, now Aretha Castle Boulevard, and as I recall, two firemen. I hope I'm not doing anybody a disservice by only naming two, but I think it was two who died in that fire. 
and it was in a uh, a uh, abandoned building because by this time Aretha Castle Haley or Dried Street had lost any almost all of its vitality and the buildings many were sitting there vacant and the times Picayune wrote I think an un very unfair editorial about these two men having been needlessly lost their lives because we were letting these abandoned buildings stand without taking them down. So as usual, uh, I responded uh, uh, quickly and uh, directed the staff to start enforcing immediately all of our demolition laws of and we began to tear down buildings, forcing people to tear them down. Now many people are not unhappy about tearing them down, and sometimes they had to go through problems to tear buildings down. So, and the staff came to me and said, Mayor, stop. Mayor, you gotta stop. You start, we, we're losing too many historic buildings. Who was it that, who came to you, do you remember? I don't recall exactly. It was one of my immediate staff, though. A number of them. It might have been Tony Gagliano, it could have been Larry Coleman, um, younger, more sensitive people than I was. Uh, I didn't see any great value in those buildings. I'm not talking about the French Quarter now, I'm talking about those buildings that sat out there and they were they were 100 years old but they didn't, they honestly, I was klutz, they didn't mean much to me. But I accepted their advice and said, fine, what do we do about it? So we created the Historic Districts Commission and, uh, and filled it with very, very competent people. The, uh, made, asked Moe Stieg, who was a very prominent lawyer in town, to head it up. And of course, it grew from there, and then in many ways, the purpose of it, I don't say the purpose changed, but uh, typically of these movements, conservatives or liberals or progressives take over and they begin to become not exactly what, what was intended, but you have what you have. So we've got these various historic districts at right now, and then they operate under different rules of, you know, of whether they you have to get approval to change the paint color of this, or whether you just designate it as a historic district. Yeah. For, for Do you think reasons. that's been over the last 40 years then, a success in uh Oh, I think it's been very protecting successful. Protecting the, the things that you value. Oh, I do. I think, I think it's very successful. But it's like anything else. I mean, if you ask me every, I could give you an unqualified yes overall. Mm -hmm. But it's like anything else. If you ask for this particular thing, on that particular thing, or this particular thing, is that, do I agree with that or not? No, I mean, you, you're obviously going to have disagreements, the more finite the question. I mean, the overall issue of, yeah, do you believe in historic preservation? Yes, I think it's a good thing in a city like this. Uh, is it perfect? No. Does it have its drawbacks? Absolutely. Let me ask, on, on another sort of urban design issue, um, you mentioned the interstate highway, and there was a, a sense that when Claiborne Avenue was uh, was cleared of its oak trees and Interstate 10 came through. There's some people uh, in who, particularly people who lived in the Treme neighborhood and along Claiborne Avenue, thought that uh, a black community was being uh, inconvenienced <coughs> for the sake of um, of making it easier to get to the suburbs. Did, were you, did that sentiment uh, rise to the surface? I never, I don't recall that sentiment being being very prevalent. It was... Perhaps not before it was built, but afterwards? Well, afterwards, uh, yeah, clearly there were people who uh, were unhappy that this road, road was, elevated roadway was coming down, coming down their street. And I can only liken it to the building of the 
uh, Second Mississippi River Bridge. Uh, the parallel span. Yeah, and uh, when you when we were looking at building that, we did studies that showed that that it should be built. I'm trying to reflect back. It would be uptown. Napoleon Avenue, one of the streets within right. Napoleon to Louisiana was basically where it would go without a specific, you know, given point of reference. But the idea of tearing down so many houses, I mean, first of all, the roadway is not nearly wide enough where you could just run one. Uh, tearing down houses, then you, the thing is coming off the river and it's not going to hit ground until past the St. Charles Avenue and, and uh, so we ran into such opposition that we ended up with the parallel span down in the warehouse district. Well, if you look at that, now let's look at the leg, Clavin leg of the of the interstate highway system. It's running down. I'm not trying to justify it because I know it's unpopular. <coughs> but I'm trying to put my myself back <coughs> pardon me. God bless you. In the position of the planners at the time. You're looking at a leg that will service downtown. Uh, it is going down this very broad neutral ground. That was the most beautiful place in the world. It was not. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and it's uh, it was pretty direct, pretty direct route to where they wanted to go. Now you can exaggerate the racial aspects of it. Well, you did it just because it's black. I'm not saying that that was not a factor. Would would they would it have happened if it were Canal Boulevard? I don't know. I don't know. So nobody's got to convince me of the horrible racial injustices that we have done here in the Civil War. I mean, the Civil, the Civil War, the slavery, and then Jim Crow. That's you can't even begin to justify any of that. And the remnants are still with us, but I'm not so sure that there was this specific thing that this is yeah, right. a poor black neighborhood. Let's put it there. It's a lot of things converge. Now, cheap land always is a factor of where you're going to put stuff. When we've dealt with this, oh, I have one, thank you. We, we, we dealt, we've dealt with this in... Uh, Mr. Mayor, you want to take a break for a minute? No, just a second. Let me finish this thought. We've dealt with this when I was Secretary of HUD. Where do you put housing for the poor? Think about it, okay? We've got an obligation. We have an, we have an agreement, no argument. We believe that we need to build housing for the poor. Now, there's some conservatives who think not, but I'd say the vast majority of Americans, uh, while the opinion given the condition of the housing, we need to do something for, for the ultra, very poor, give them a place to live. Well, what kind of housing? What uh, what quality housing and where do you put it? Well, you put it in poor neighborhoods, but you put it in poor neighborhoods, you're duplicating. You're not helping the problem that you're confronted with. Well, let's put it on St. Charles Avenue. No, no, we <laughs> can't do that either because, number one, the land's too expensive. You could never afford it. Uh, it is a serious problem to meet these social economic things when you're trying to deal with race and poverty and culture and ethnicity. So uh, to say that it didn't, that didn't count at all, I can't say that. I don't. I just don't believe it was a dominant, dominant factor. In another expressway that I think you mentioned earlier that uh, was proposed, again, by the federal government, it's not city government that's building these roadways, uh, was the, the Riverfront Expressway right. proposal. And uh, there was an awful lot of support for that uh, roadway 
going in front of the French Quarter along the Mississippi River, uh, but it was uh, canceled by the Nixon administration. And in, in keeping with your um, efforts to want to make the downtown area as livable and strong as possible, did that decision turn out okay? Are we all right without the Riverfront Expressway? Well, I think we're far better off, and I think I was on the wrong side of that issue as a councilman. But in self-defense, uh, that issue had already been decided before I got on the city council. One of the last acts of the council that served between 1952 and 56 was to approve the building of that expressway and to approve the, and also appropriate the money to build the tunnel uh, under Parger Street and under Canal Street, and which was effectively dug already and in existence under what was then the Rivergate Convention Center, which is now Harris Casino. And that highway is part of Harris building. Uh, you'd have to go into the building and go downstairs into what would be a sub-basement to see this huge subway, I mean expressway system built down there. That was a piece of the riverfront expressway. That was it. And uh, the piece that hadn't been built, of course, was what happens between Poitras and uptown New Orleans and, and the Mississippi River Bridge, I should say. And what happens in the Group RA? The, all of the financial interest, or I should say all, the vast majority of financial interest, business interest, uh, had pressed to have this done. Now what was happening across the United States, and uh, I think particularly out in California, there's a big argument about the expressway being so muscular and taking almost any path that it wanted to. Uh, and everybody genuflecting to the pathway of this system. And the Embarcadero, as I recall the name of it. In uh, San Francisco. In San, excuse me, San Francisco. Not, well, not Los Angeles, San Francisco. The Embarcadero, uh, there were protests about building it. And protests developed here about, through preservationists, about building the leg through the French Quarter. And ultimately, the federal department canceled it, not at the request of the city government, but canceled the project. And it was a great thing. But once that got canceled, then you were confronted with, well, what do we do now since we're not going to have this interstate highway system, which had been guiding the developmental thoughts, if there were any, about the riverfront, uh, where are we going to put it? What are we going to do with it? So I began to concentrate on what do we do now with the riverfront? What opportunities have we've lost this expressway? So we lost the transportation thing, and I'm glad we lost it. I'm, I'm saying that it was already what we were faced with when I was a councilman was whether to cancel it, that is to undo what had already been done, throw the money away that had already been invested in this tunnel. And I think, looking back, I was on the wrong side of that issue. It's worth throwing it away. So what you were left with was a French Quarter that didn't have an expressway in front right. of it. Right. And, and since for years they had been planning this thing, not much had happened, and so it gave us the opportunity to do something with the riverfront in the French Quarter. And hence you end up with the moonwalk and with the Washington Artillery Park. I'd gone to Paris, excuse me, I'd gone to Rome, and, and I've learned a lot looking at cities around the world, particularly in the United States. But Vern and I were sitting on the steps of the Spanish steps in Rome, and it just dawned on me, bang, I can build these steps over that wall. And
and came home and hired some architects and came up with a rendering of building the steps to get over the wall so people could see the river. And that's why the, for the first material for the first park time. was there. It was simply used as a place to park cars. And uh, How did it, and it was an ugly it was an ugly environment. So I mean that has added tremendously, I think, to the the French Quarter, just the ability to walk up and see the river. And this again was one of the reasons why we're here, so why we've cut ourselves off from this great asset. How did it get uh, the name Moonwalk, that part part of it? <coughs> uh, well, of course, my nickname is Moon, and uh, my brother-in-law, who was my executive assistant, came to me and, without my permission, uh, said, we're going to call it the Moonwalk. I said, you what? He said, put a, put a sign up. We're going to call this the Moonwalk. <laughs> I said, okay. What wasn't Moon Landrew. They didn't use my name. There was no dedication or anything. Just put a little sign up, called it the Moonwalk. Now, whether it was a playoff on uh, on Jackson and uh, his song or whatever, that little thing he did, shuffle back and forth. But it's gotten to be the Moonwalk. Not well, it's, many, it's, not many it's, people know why it's named that way, but that's how it happened. Well, it stayed as a name. Pardon? It stayed as a name. Yes. Can I ask you? We, we, we I told you we wouldn't take all all. Uh, it's okay. Day, I don't. I'm in no hurry. I have nothing. Um, but I wanted to ask you uh, uh, at least one other Go ahead. Uh, uh, urban on on the so we've got so many things we can Go talk ahead. about. Sure. But I think on the area of the you know just the physical city, how did the Superdome get downtown? I mean, as besides John McKiffin who agreed to pay for it and Dave Dixon who pushed it, uh, you were the person who made it happen uh, in in downtown New Orleans. And what were the it seems to be consensus these days that it's a good thing to have a Superdome downtown. Uh, it's proved its, <coughs> its promise. How did it get there? As I said, I've, uh, if you're half smart, which I'm at least claim to be half smart, uh, you got to see, you got to learn something if you're keeping your eyes open. And, uh, I was president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and in that capacity, I was required to travel to quite a few cities throughout the United States as we held meetings and, and uh, conventions and plans. So I tried to look at every city that I could to see what was good about it, what was not so good about it, what did they have that we didn't, and what opportunities were available to us. So as we were, we had committed to build this stadium, Dave Dixon came up with the idea. Of course, he was promoting the professional franchise here, and Dave's do all the credit in the world for selling the idea of us building a dome stadium, but his original idea was for the purpose of putting it out in uh, New Orleans East. Uh, as it developed, uh, McKithen had turned to me and asked me what I, I had called him and said that, Governor, we have promised these people to build a stadium and nothing has happened on it. And he won't go through all the conversation, but essentially it was, Boone, I'm glad you called me. I wish you'd undertake that for me. I said, Governor, I don't know. I built a stadium. He said, you'll get it done. So I contacted enough people to find out where we should begin. Harry Udell was a bond attorney, and so he and I drafted the legislation. He basically doing all the technical work and my telling him how I thought we ought to run it. That is the formation of the commission and what powers and stuff. So in any event, the thing finally passes. And now we're in the process of of having a survey done as to where to put this stadium. Jefferson Parish wants it in Jefferson Parish. Charlene's wants it in Orleans Parish. Uh, 
There are various pieces of real estate around that would love to have the dome stadium built in their area. And uh, I had gone to see St. Louis, and St. Louis had built a downtown stadium. It wasn't a dome stadium. There were no other dome stadiums except the one in Houston. And Houston had built theirs way out, away from Houston. And I'd been to Pittsburgh, and I think, I think it was Pittsburgh, I hope my time is correct, that they had built a downtown stadium. Uh, but they were not dome stadiums. And I just felt that, look, this thing can be a huge economic generator for us. We've got a lot of places where we could put, not a lot, but we've got some places we could put this thing downtown rather than another kind of sprawl out in either our suburbs or Jefferson suburbs. I was not the only one with that thought. Other people have said that Russell Long passed the site and said we ought to put the dome there or Hale Boggs or somebody else. I can only speak for myself. I knew from the city mayor, the city, not a planner, because I can't claim to be a planner, but as a person vitally interested in development and the CBD and what we were doing, I was determined to put it downtown. Uh, and as it turned out, that's where we went. I mean, there was a, it was a dilapidated railroad yard. The railroads didn't need the property any longer. Uh, rail transportation had shifted. Uh, it was right at the end of Poydras Street, not at the end of, but sort of at the end of. Uh, great location, and uh, initially uh, the stadium was going to front on Loyal Avenue. But that would have been, there were 65 acres on this site. But it was expensive, not that Loyola was expensive at the time, not that the street was expensive at the time, but another 10 acres for us. We were pressed for money. So we took back, we took the back 55 acres and let the railroads keep the front 10. It worked for them economically, it worked for us economically. So that's where the Hyatt is built now, on that acreage that at one time was to be the Dome Stadium. We moved it back and we built the parking garages with it and a multitude of other things. But yes, downtown it was very important and it's been a huge catalyst uh, to keep the downtown viable. It wasn't really a Com conventional wisdom in American city planning in the early 1970s that you should have a downtown. That if you're going to build a stadium, it should be downtown. Well, I can't as, tell as you, but said, they were going no, I'm ways. not telling did you. Did you have to? Did you have to fight hard for that? No, there were people who opposed to it, obviously. But no, I said I, I had allies. They, yeah. who, say they came to it under their own conclusions. Why they came there, I don't know. But uh, Russell Long was was for it, uh, and uh, I think Hale Boggs, I don't know, Mascaro certainly had no objection, but it was in his campaign running against Jimmy Fitzmaurice that the idea in 1956, 60, no, not 56, 19, oh, Help me for a minute. R running for mayor? Yeah, 19... Well, well Vicksgear would have been 62 and 66, or... It was in the 1965, well, the campaign's running 65, yeah, right, 65. campaign, that Dave had gone to him about building a dome stadium, and it was part of his late, very late campaign strategy to advocate building this dome stadium with Dave Dixon. They were together in a press conference to build it in, uh, in New Orleans East. And this was Mayor Skiro's? Yeah. yeah. Now, Dave, Dave did not object, as far as I can recall at all, to building it downtown. That wasn't an issue with Dave. Dave had gotten together with, uh, with a fellow by the name of Lecrata, or Lecrat, 
there was a crack track out there, big real estate, undeveloped land in New Orleans East, and he was going to donate, supposedly. Uh, I don't know whether it was valid or not, but the argument was he would donate a lot of land to build the stadium and benefit from the surrounding land. Now, maybe he kept all the parking. I don't know. I don't know what the deal was. Not a f bad deal. There's nothing wrong with it at all. But it was out in New Orleans East. But what I'm simply saying, Dave was interested in getting the stadium built. The fact is that happened to be a yep. convenient location. So he was not at all opposed to putting the stadium down. So how did, they, how did uh, Mayor Skiro back away from the, uh, the New Orleans East site and it, get back to Because it wasn't, I, I don't know. It, it, Mayor Skiro was a fascinating man. Uh, I, I don't think Mayor Skiro had... It was an idea, you know, and it was a, you know, we say a lot of things in campaigns that, that, that aren't going to come true. I think he probably saw it at the time. He said it was a good idea and a good thing. We can build the Dome Stadium. We didn't have a team at the time. It was a matter of saying we'll build a stadium and attract a team, you know, build it and they will come. So uh, it was a big, big idea. It was a great idea on Dave's part. It was good for Skiro's campaign, uh, and, it, and it was good for the promotion of building a dome stadium. What, what if, what if the, the stadium had been built in New Orleans East? What would, what would downtown New Orleans be like now? Uh, it's hard for me to imagine. I'm not saying it would be gone or dead, but it wouldn't be the place it is. Clearly, clearly it has helped uh, it, it's become an iconic thing now. I mean, just the, the picture of it, the nature of it. And we're now planning things around that dome in Champion Square and the, and the restaurants that are starting to build in the warehouse district. And housing. Uh, there was, in my mind, uh, and I didn't, I didn't invent this concept, but you think of a modern shopping center as built like a, a cross. And the idea is you put anchor stores that pull people into the center. These were the 1960 centers. Well, if you're looking at a city like New Orleans and you're trying to be something of a city developer, I'm not talking about a real estate developer, I'm talking about a city developer. What is the city? Who is the city? Where is it going? I mean, you're talking about parks, city park, Audubon parks, playgrounds, lakefront development, riverfront walks, with big, broad concepts. <coughs> I saw the downtown part, the core of New Orleans, as French Quarter being, think about one anchor, Armstrong Park being another anchor, Dome Stadium being an anchor, and the Convention Center being an anchor. So you got these four anchors and something good is going to happen in between all of that. Something good's got to happen if you got four department stores, bing, 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 and the traffic can only go where you want it to go. So the Dome played that role as being the anchor of that, make a square and just put a corner on every square without being a cross like this, which, because you don't control those totally the inner streets. Well, if you do this, you control the streets, but if you do a square, then the people are going to have to just find their little way in between, but something good's going to happen. New Orleans did get a <coughs> building boom on Pointer Street uh, yep. Between the Superdome and no the, question about it. And, and, and what was what was driving that in the 1970s? Was that the national economy, the oil economy? Well, the oil or, economy. Or the, we were doing, you, or the fact that you were getting some traction to making New Orleans uh, seem. We were like doing a very place. well with the oil economy at the time, uh, but uh, the Dome Stadium. We we spent at that time. I knew it. it doesn't sound like much today. It was $163 million to build it. 
which was they, perceived as an outrageous amount back yes, then. Yes, they would be about $800 million. Well, you can't spend $800 million in one spot if you've done it well, which the Dome, I think, is a great-looking building. The architects did a beautiful job. Without creating some value, I mean, it's... So, the opportunity, you know, coupled with the beautiful building, uh, what else was happening in the city that uh, we put up? I think there were one, two, three office buildings built right adjacent to it. I'm not saying they were built just because of the dome, but if the dome hadn't been there, they probably would have been located somewhere else. Uh, but once Parja Street was open because of the dome, and Mascaro's administration had widened Parja Street, uh, development was starting down Parja Street. It was moving out of com off of Common Street and Carondelet and St. Charles in what was the center of the office building district and was essentially moving uh, as one shell square did on, on Parja Street. It was that a policy of the labor no, administration no, to try to get was, it there? No, there or? was no policy to it. We were not trying to take business from this section, put it in that section. And that was just market forces. Uh, obviously, what you do uh, is going to create opportunities for people in, in the way of city planning of parks and, and streets and avenues. So... Part just became a nice wide avenue and people began to build on it. Now, if you could take that nice wide avenue and put it out in the lower ninth ward, then you're not going to have 50 stories built out there. I mean, you, it's, so it's yeah. not one thing, it's a combination. Yeah. And then, it, it, as it turned out, um, the building that took place largely on Poitras Street in the 1970s and early 1980s was the New Orleans landscape <coughs> that lasted for another uh, 20, 25 years and, uh, in, until after Katrina for the most part. I mean, the, the, the city we built then was the city that we lived with for a few decades. Yeah, no longer. question about it. Uh, as I said, when we began this conversation, not only do you have to look at the plates that were moving prior to 1970. Whether those were the interstate highway system, whether it was racial integration, whether whatever it was, was building and happening that affected that period. Mm -hmm. You also have to get back where we are today and look back at the 70s or look back at the 80s or back at the 50s or 60s and say, okay, what was good about it? What was bad about it? What were the lasting effects? Was some of it, was some of it just temporary? Will any of it last for any length of time? Uh, for instance, we built we built the the River Gate, and by all measurement, it was a magnificently designed building. It ain't there no more, as they say in the song. Uh, you know, that area took on a different configuration. We've just uh, been through a debate and still going through it, whether to keep uh, the International Trademark Building uh, in its present location. What impact does it have if you take it down? Uh, and that was one of the early anchors of Poitras Street. Yes, it was. Mid-1960s, mid yes, it was, it was the river end of the street. Yeah. I mean, you have city planners. There are people yeah. whose names I can't even recall today, and, and no one individual. I mean, there's a, who was a famous guy from New York? Everybody gives him. Robert Moses? Yeah, Moses. Moses gotten to be a... He was line. the one who wanted the Riverfront Expressway. Well, yeah. but he's gotten such a big reputation as if he... And maybe he is, I don't know, but the way they pounce on... But things don't happen that way. 
I'm not saying there aren't people who come up with ideas. I'd like to believe I had one or two of the many ideas that have happened. But they're staff people. There are me sitting on the steps in, in Rome and, and all of a sudden saying, you know, I can do this in New Orleans. And, uh, or sitting and seeing the soup, seeing a ballpark in St. Louis and say, why don't we build the stadium downtown? Okay? Uh, so you, you not only are seeing things and plagiarizing, so to speak, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not illegitimate, you're not, it's just an idea. I mean, there are no, no, they're not that many geniuses in the world that can keep coming up with brand new ideas that no one ever in the history of the world has ever thought of. So you, 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 you're looking at things, and staff is looking at things. Now you've got a planning staff. And how Katner was a good guy. And he, was, he was the director of the city planning commission. Yes, and he and Stu Brem before him was director of planning commission. And depending upon their personality, they are always drawing maps. And this would be good, this would be good. Put a tree here, put a road here, switch this to this. I mean, they're, they're artists working on a, on a large screen, uh, on a large canvas. Now, some of what they come up with works, some of it doesn't. Uh, what do you do with railroads when they get abandoned? Like the Loyal Avenue at Canal Street was going from Canal back to Armstrong Park with railroad tracks. Okay, they took the station down. It's a nice boulevard today. Uh, Speaking of plans, though, uh, one of the, uh, you had very uh, interesting, ambitious plans for Armstrong Park that you mentioned earlier. Uh, do you still think, uh, and it didn't happen, it didn't get executed while you were mayor. Uh, it was on land that had been demolished for a civic, for a cultural center right. by your predecessors. Well, the cultural center had been planned way back in the Morrison administration right. at the end of the 40s. And uh, got to remember where New Orleans was at the time. We were not 85% of the population, but it were by far the dominant parish, even in 1950s, 1950. We were by far the dominant parish. Uh, we had 20 legislators, Jefferson had two. Uh, Jefferson stopped at Bonnebel. That's where East Jefferson stopped. So New Orleans was, was dominant. Uh, and uh, and there was a justification for a cultural center with performing Well, arts. because we were strong and powerful and the interests who had elected Morrison were, were uptown nice, good people. And they thought it was very nice to have an opera house and a, and a, and a theater house and a cultural center of some magnitude. And, and unfortunately, uh, they tore down an awful lot of houses to create this. Now, my administration ended up finishing the tear down, but those had, the plans had already been done. It's not an excuse for me. It's just that that's the, we got in the grants and just completed the job. But then the question was whether to build this center as it had been planned. And Mascaro had started the Mahalia Jackson thing and my administration finished it and I helped Mascaro build it during his administration. But we concluded that's the last one we're doing. We're not going to build yeah. out this plan and we're going to abort it. So now we got the land and what do we do with it? And uh, in the meantime I had appointed Charlie asked Charlie Ferguson and Dutch Morial, who was then a judge at the time, to head up a committee to come up with a monument for Louis Armstrong, some kind of a monument. And how they came up with the idea of converting Armstrong Park into a monument for Louis Armstrong, I'm not quite sure. I was always for putting a guy on a horse with a sword in his hand. I know that worked. Every monument I've seen with somebody with the horse and sword in hand was monumental. So, so that's why we've got so many, so many of those. But in any event, uh, I think Charlie had uh, 
I'd been to Copenhagen with Charlie, and he had the idea we could build a, uh, not just him, I think he's, there were other people, build something like the Copenhagen, uh, which is a combination, combination of restaurants, uh, water, urban system. The, the Tivoli Gardens? I, I had reservations. I was fully supportive of it, make no mistake. But I had my reservations as to whether it would work or not because we, for lots of different reasons, I thought race was a factor, uh, climate was a factor. How was race a factor? Well, you're in a, uh, in a pretty much of a black neighborhood. And when you think of the 1950s, 1960s, and this we're now in the 1970s, but this whole racial thing was bubbling very much. I mean, when we integrated City Hall, it was in the integration of the school system, a very volatile period. Uh, so to put that facility in that particular neighborhood, I didn't see, look, I approved it and I supported it. I just simply said I had reservations about whether or not it would work to the extent that Copenhagen did. I was enthusiastically for the project, but there were reservations. And I thought race was a factor, and then climate was a factor. And also, <coughs> the crazy calendar, or the moon, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say, that I don't know what time it gets dark in Copenhagen, what time it gets dark in, right. in our time zone. So there were lots of different reasons, and Copenhagen, is a, if, we could have, if we could do what Copenhagen did, it would be just spectacular. Did you run out of time for this? I mean, the... No. The, the boom of the 70s? No, and no the... time didn't have anything to do with it. We, we simply didn't, couldn't draw, we couldn't complete and get the attractions. Now, is it, in retrospect, is it a bad idea? No, I think people will come to love this park. I think it's growing in popularity now. But if you recall, we had a murder in that park, and it just put a chill over a lot of things for a long time. And it's next to the housing project, and one thing or the next. But I predict there will come a time when that is going to be a, uh, a very widely used and appreciated piece of real estate. And I'm not saying that defensively. Uh, lots of things I've tried. Uh, didn't work. I tried to build fountains in the French Quarter. Uh, uh, we, I've gone to cities and saw that Paris could have fountains. Why can't we have fountains? We can't have fountains. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> can't give you all the reasons why we can't have fountains. You, you mean you were told that we can't have fountains? Well, but... no. People have proven that we can't have fountains. At least not now. Because they just, uh, either we didn't maintain them or, or the... Uh, the public was not enchanted by them. Uh, some, I don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody in the future can build fountains that'll work. We, I, I wasn't able to do it. Well, th this is. Um, we promised you that uh, we'd, we'd be out of here at five uh, five o'clock. I don't care about the time. And we have. Um, we've been talking for an hour and a half. Come back another day if you want. Yeah. That's fine. I'll do it as long I, as you want to talk about it. We have uh, so many topics we could be talking about, and pretty much we've we've stayed here on the on the subject of the uh, of the urban environment and revitalizing the physical city and. There's so many other topics. If we could come back, well, I have no problem. Revisit some of those others. If I can contribute to any, Justin, do you have this anything is, this you want to ask? I, I think in, in the next session. Okay. I don't mind doing a little personal stuff as we got in today. That's, I just don't want to get into the whole recitation by me of all what sure. we did, chapter and verse. I'm, I don't mind being applauded and given credit for a lot of stuff or being blamed, but. I'm just not looking to write a biography. That's all. Okay. Well, this is um, this is is terrifically helpful. And if we if you will have patience with us, we'll I come, have patience. We'll come back. My wife doesn't think I have patience, but I have patience. <laughs>
Thank you so much. All right, Jack. And uh, 